Hi, hi everybody. I, I know here in the room, you know who I am, but for those online, I'm Don Feaster, and I get the pleasure of introducing Michael Bradshaw. Uh, Michael's been with us for, what, about a year and a half, a little bit more uh, in the Harlow, working on various projects, but the real focus has been on powdery mildews, and please, he'll tell you about them, but they're very interesting plant pathogens. And uh, he is among a very small crowd of those who are working on powdery mildews. And uh, this is kind of a joint project. I'm involved in it, but also Uwe Braun in Germany is part of the, the project. And Uwe has written and spent a good part of his career on powdery mildews and working on powdery mildews. He inspired me in the uh, 80s when I was proofreading his big monograph on European powdery mildews to go out and begin looking at these and collecting them. One of the interesting things about the powdery mildews is that in the old days, in the 80s, pre early 80s, pre-molecular times, there was always this debate about host specificity. Uh, can you name them based on hosts? Uh, we had morphology. It turns out the morphology that we were using at that point really wasn't uh, the morphology that we learned about when phylogenies came along. So this has been a, a group that's really uh, come to life in a very different way after we get, had molecular phylogenies. And Michael has taken this on. Uh, the goal is to understand and work on North American powdery mildews, which are very poorly known uh, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, Michael is not uh, singly working on powdery mildews. He's done genomic work, uh, comparing and looking at various regions to uh, look at utility. He's uh, developed a uh, secondary barcode for these powdery mildews. So he's done lots of things. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Uh, Thanks, Don. I, I really appreciate that. So the title of my talk today is Powdery Mildews, the World's Best Plant Taxonomist. And, you know, I, as I grew up, I, I was always really into plants. I imagine most of you guys in this room are also really into plants. And I, I always think that I got so lucky that this group, the Powdery Mildews chose me because it combines my two interests of fungi and plants. I don't know if you guys feel that way too, but you usually don't choose the system you study. It usually falls into your lap. Originally, I was going to study uh, viruses on tulips. And so I'm really happy where I ended up. Uh, today for my talk, I'd, I'd like it to be a little bit more informal. So if you guys want to ask questions during the talk, that's totally fine. And I'm going to ask you guys a little questions, some questions. Um, so I tailored this talk really towards the plant hosts because I thought that most of you guys were interested in plants. And I just want to go through here. Here are some common hosts of the powdery mildews. These were all found at botanical gardens. Uh, almost all the pictures that you're going to see were taken by Luis Quejada. Uh, he's amazing with the microscope. He works at the Farlow. And I'm just really happy that I got him on board to start working with the powdery mildews. So can anyone identify at least the genus, any of these, uh, these plants? I know that some of you can. What about this one? Come on. Yeah, okay. And well, this one's a little bit tougher. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> this is Carpinus. I, I never, I didn't get this one to the species level. Uh, so if you guys want to have an idea, I'd, I'm willing to listen. What about this one? This one's really common, a really common host for powdery mildews. No one here? It, it's uh, used to make beer. This was collected at the Arnold Arboretum. Hops. Yep. And then here, this was collected right outside. Does anyone have an idea? It's probably flowering right now. Yeah, good. Witch hazel. And then what about this one? This was collected in Harvard Yard. This is an asculus. I, I feel like you guys knew this better than you showed up right there. 
Okay, so just a brief overview of my talk today. I'm going to do an introduction to powdery mildew. Uh, if you came to my talk earlier, this is pretty much going to be the exact same thing I did then. Um, but I'm sure that you guys have probably forgot, and it's really important to understand the life cycle and the morphology of powdery mildews. Then I want to go over the powdery mildew host range. Um, I recently conducted a study to try and understand, you know, how many plants are these infecting? And I'm going to go over some of those results. Then I'm going to talk about powdery mildew in botanical gardens. So, of course, when you have areas of high plant diversity, you're also going to have areas of high powdery mildew diversity. And I really wanted to show this. So I conducted a study uh, at botanical gardens throughout North America. And then last, I'm going to talk about two different systems, uh, uh, which are really common hosts of powdery mildews. That's powdery mildew on helianthus species, that's sunflowers and powdery mildews on Quercus species. And this is gonna be an emphasis on North American Quercus. And then last, I'm gonna go over some host specificity examples. That word always gives me such a hard time to say. So you're gonna have to bear with me. Um, and I'm gonna quiz you guys on your powdery mildew taxonomy skills. So based on the host, I wanted to see if you guys can tell me where this is gonna fall in the powdery mildew phylogeny. Okay, so what is exactly powdery mildew? So it's an obligate fungal pathogen within the family Erzipaceae. That means that it needs a living host to survive. It can't survive, you cannot culture it. And this makes it very, very difficult to study. And one of the main reasons that many people haven't studied powdery mildews. So although it's difficult to study, this has been really good and beneficial for my research as it's really an open field. It infects over 10,000 species of plants and this is strictly angiosperms plants. And it's one of the most prevalent pathogens in the world. Uh, literally, powdery mildew is everywhere. And I now have some data to uh, prove that it's one of the most path prevalent pathogens in the world. And it's also here in North America, it's one of the hot spots for diversity. There are 906 species of powdery mildew that have been reported, and over 300 are in North America alone. So why did I choose powdery mildew? One is that it's everywhere. And not only is it everywhere, there's been such a limited amount of research that's been done on it. For example, here, we're looking at uh, this specimen. This is a lupinus. It's completely covered with powdery mildew. And this plant, yeah, I mean, you can't miss it if you see this outside. It was right in front of the biology building at University of Washington. And there have been a lot of famous mycologists that have gone through the University of Washington and missed this. Kathy Labulio is one of them. <laughs> oh, this, I, I have a feeling there was a lupinous plant there. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, that, so there was one undescribed species right in front of the biology building. Now my data just from here at Harvard, around the far low, we have three undescribed species and one species that was in the wrong genus. So that is, uh, just within a 20 yard radius of, of this, uh, this building. And this really made me think, um, and I wanna quote Amy Rossman here, cause I thought this was such a good quote for, for the system that I study. And she said, uh, Amy Rossman is a very famous mycologist. And she said, for some types of organisms such as microfungi, New York state's forests are almost as unexplored as the tropical forests. And I just wanna go a step further and say that I would say that Harvard campus is as unexplored as a tropical forest, as for powdery mildews. So the powdery mildew life cycle, um, like most fungi, it has an asexual stage, which you'll see here in the upper left-hand corner, or your guys' is right. And this consists of these conidia fours, which are these chains of conidia. Um, these conidia are the asexual spores and they'll break off when the wind comes in. And there have been reports that one conidium has traveled over 500 miles. So these powdery mildews are really good at, at infecting plants and spreading. And then here on the bottom, we have the sexual cycle of powdery mildew. And this consists of these resistant structures called chasmothecium. These allow powdery mildew to overwinter. They protect the acai, which holds the products of meiosis, the ascospores. So now I want to just 
go over powdery mildew evolution, you know, based on the molecular clock work, when did these little fungi evolve? And the most recent estimate was done in 2004. Um, and this was done by Suzumu Takamatsu, uh, one of the main powdery mildew scientists. He was the first one to sequence, to really sequence and conduct phylogenetic analysis on powdery mildews. And he found that powdery mildews evolved around 100 million years ago. And now it's really important to understand, to use molecular clocks with fungi, and especially powdery mildews, because there's nothing in the fossil record. And what was really interesting about his find, findings is that he saw that powdery mildews evolved right here at the same time that we're seeing uh, the, a great radiation event of angiosperms. So powdery mildews are st strictly evolved with angiosperms. And what's also interesting is we're, we're not seeing any powdery mildews on any basal lineages of plants. So you don't see it on liverworts, mosses, ferns. You also don't see it on gymnosperms. So if any of you guys find it on any of those plants, please bring it to me. That would be a really nice paper. Uh, but, you know, these are so host specific and they really can't, they really haven't been able to jump um, lineages. And then in around 75 million years ago, that's when we saw the diversification of powdery mildews. And as Don kind of alluded to, this is really based on the plant host. These, these fungi are very, very host specific. And one of the main reasons they're hypothesized to have been so successful on their hosts is this little morphological feature called the hostorium. So what you're looking at here, this is like the powdery mildew mouth. And this enters the cell, uh, the cuticle, and it does this both by, uh, uh, the powdery mildew enters the cuticle both by uh, chemically and mechanically. And it will attach to the epidermal cells and it will break through the cell wall. And this is the really important part. Um, it will not break through the plasma mem membrane. So it is keeping the plant hosts alive. It is very advantageous for the powdery mildew to not kill the plant. So now just um, a phylogeny of the powdery mildews. Briefly here, we have 19 different genera of powdery mildew. And what I wanna point out is that phylogenetic analyses have revealed associations between powdery mildew genera with certain plant families. The red means that the powdery mildew has been associated, has been reported as a host for a certain family. So you do have certain genera of powdery mildew like erysiphe that infects almost everything. Erysiphe is everywhere. But then you also have these really host specific genera. Lumeria only infects grasses. Cystotheca only affects Phagaceae. Potosphera here, it looks like it's infecting a lot of different families, but this is predominantly on rosaceae. Same with Golovinomyces, a lot of color families are colored, but this is almost exclusively on Asteraceae. So you get a lot of host specificity, oh, specificity based on the um, powdery mildew genus. So before we go any further, I just wanna go over the powdery mildew species concept. So what is a species? Uh, I have been working on a powdery mildew monograph, both with Don and Uva Braun, who as Don alluded to is the expert of powdery mildews. Um, and, and the work that he, he did was really incredible and it's making my job really easy. Uh, if you go through any the powdery mildew collections at the Farlow, almost every single one is annotated by Uva. So I, I guess he had a, a, a mass request in the 80s and he analyzed I, probably over 2000 specimens of, of powdery mildews from the far left. Uh, but so we started this series in Mycologia. Each paper is a different, goes over a different genus of the powdery mildews. Uh, but in the first paper, we uh, established the species concept. And I just wanna go over it here. There are some things that you know are pretty common for most uh, groups such as new species should not enter, should, new species should not be introduced without supporting sequence data. All recognized species should form well supported monophyletic clades. But then now here I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are more specific to the powdery mildews. Phylogenetic sister species should be separated by unique morphologies and or unique host ranges. So I call this the two thirds rule. So to, to describe a new powdery mildew species, we would like it to form a monophyletic group and be separated, but so have separate genetics and or unique morphologies or unique host ranges. 
So if we have you know a powdery mildew that only affects um, Acer macrophyllum, big leaf maple, it doesn't infect any other host, but it does not have a unique morphology, we are going to call that a new species. Same with if it has a unique morphology and a wide host range, but it, it's just genetically can be differentiated, we're also going to call that a new species. So it's the two-thirds rule. And then this is where it gets a little bit dicey, is that for the interim, taxa that are not phylogenetic separable, so that they don't have genetic differences, but have clear morphological differences, we're going to designate those as varieties. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of, for powdery mildew taxonomy, it's almost exclusively done with the ITS region. And sometimes the ITS isn't so great at differentiating species. So if there are morphological differences, we're going to call them varieties until uh, we can take a multi-locus approach or look at full genomes. Okay, yeah. Okay, proposed. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, now that uh, I've gone over the species concept, I want to go over some of the appendage morphology. And the reason for this is that the features of the host plant co evolve with the morphology of the powdery mildew sexual stage. In the past, I used to think that the appendages of the the, they used to name powdery mildew genera based on appendage morphology. So for example, this was in the genus Unsanula, and now uh, it's finding that we're finding out that these appendages aren't really matching with the powdery mildew phylogeny. It's actually, these have evolved convergently with the host plant. So this plant, this is a Irizyphe flexuosa on Ascalus flava collected from Harvard Yard. Mostly all of my collections are from botanical gardens or um, university campuses. So what I want to point out here is that we have this uh, curved um, circinate appendages. You can really see them here. And these, these powdery mildews are so cool. So they can lift themselves off of the host plant and then they can be dispersed through wind or other mechanisms. And then here we have these, these um, curved appendages, which allow the powdery mildew to hook onto the, the branch of another close by plant or on the plant that it was originally on. So these are often found on deciduous plants because they drop their leaves, it hooks onto the bark or of the, um, of the buds. And then when the buds open the next year, we have a new powdery mildew uh, infection. Same here, what we're looking at is uh, a new combination on Potosfera. And this was uh, collected in just right outside here. And here we have Irizyphe arcuata, and this is on Carpinus. Uh, and this was collected from the Washington State Arboretum. But we're also looking at these branched appendages. So if you look right here, these they're branched. And up here, we have somewhat branched appendages. And the current hypothesis, this was all done in 2021, this work that um, matched the appendage morphology to the host plant um, life cycle. This is also found on deciduous plants. So this allows the powdery mildew to hook on to the bark or the buds of the plant as it loses its leaves. And then here's another example. So this is really interesting. So we have this mycelium-like appendages. This is the powdery mildew that affects hops, Potosfera macularis on Humulus lupulus. And this is on the Arnold, at the Arnold Arboretum on the Lanistera Trail. This hops plant is completely covered. It was a beautiful site. And what you're seeing is this mycelium-like appendages. And what happens here is we see this mycelium-like appendages usually on a herbaceous plant. So this stays connected, intertwined with mycelium on the leaf. And as the plant dies back, um, this will stay on the leaf and then the, the plant leaves will degrade into the soil and the powdery mildew 
uh, chasmothecia will stay right on the soil. And as the plant comes up the following spring, the powdery mildew ascospores or chasmothecia will connect onto this plant coming up. So what there, and the, the, these different traits have convergently evolved throughout the powdery mildew phylogeny. Okay, so now I wanna talk about a little bit of a, a host range study that I conducted. Um, so it's really important to understand all the different hosts that powdery mildew infects. You know, this, this uh, pathogen is all over the world and there hadn't, hasn't really been any work done since 1986. So that was when the last host range analysis was done. So I contacted, um, the United States National Fungal Herbarium, and they have this amazing database of all of plant, all the plant pathogen reports that have ever been reported in the world. And um, so basically they're mining all the literature going back as far as they can and putting these all into an Excel spreadsheet, which you can search uh, in their friendly database online. So I contacted them. They gave me an Excel spreadsheet with um, all, their, all the different reports, but as you can imagine, these reports were so outdated, both in the host names and in the powdering mildew names. So I worked with Dr. David Buford uh, right here, and we, he led the efforts to update the host names. And this was not an easy task. There were a lot of hosts, um, and we looked at four or five different resources to try and update these names, and we got a team of volunteers to help us because the amount of data was just extraordinary. I'll get to that in a second. And then I also worked with Dr. Uva Braun to update the powdery mildew names. And here's some data that we uh, put together. So in the original report by Amano, he reported 9,863 host taxa. But remember in this Farr and Rossman database, they have all data that was previously reported. So everything in the Omano uh, report is going to be in the report that we have. But after, so Omano reported that around 5% of total angiosperms were reported as hosts. And I believe at the time there was a predicted 160,000 different, um, uh, angio, the prediction was that there was 160,000 different angiosperms. But then after we, uh, after Dave went through the uh, host names, this number was reduced to 8, 9,863 was reduced to 8,259. So we were finding a lot of the hosts that he reported, we reduced to synonymy. So in total, so I, like I told you, there was a lot of data to sift through. In total, there were 72,336 powdery mildew reports in this database. And what I, what I really love is that this was of, of the total amount of reports in the database, I think there was around 800,000, around 9% of them were powdery mildews. So almost every plant or 10% of the plant pathogens that were reported were powdery mildews, which I think is such an amazing number. And it really shows that this is one of the most common plant pathogens. And of these 72,336 reports, the original database had had them reported on 13,024 different host taxa. After we, we went through the host names though, we reduced this to 1,025 in 190 different genera and 205 different families. So it's really widespread throughout uh, the angiosperm lineage. Oops. Uh, and we're, what we found is the new estimate is that two and a half percent of all angiosperms are estimated to have been reported as a powdery mildew host. And then here, just a breakdown of the data. I want to show you a little bit. So this is powdery mildew, the different powdery mildew genera based on um, the different continents. So what you'll notice here is the dark blue. This is Erzyphe. As I mentioned, this is the most common powdery mildew. Uh, I also want to point out that, you know, it's on six out of seven different, uh, six out of seven of the continents in, in the world. We're just missing Antarctica. Also, if you look at Europe, we have 27,000 reports compared to North America, which has 7,000. And the amount of morphologically described species in North America and Europe is about the same. So this is just shows how much little work has been done in North America. Oh, yeah, in Europe it's 27,000. So 
almost four times the amount of in North America. So it shows how much has been done in Europe and how much little has been done in North America. Also, a lot of work has been done in Asia, but this has actually been mostly confined to Japan. That uh, uh, scientist I mentioned, Suzumu Takamatsu, he was from Japan and did a lot of great work. And then here we have the breakdown of powdery mildew hosts. And the, the big takeaway here is that the most common host is Quercus. It's this yellow right here. And to me, this is, was pretty surprising. Um, it's not so surprising in the sense that oaks are really heavily infected. And when you have a really heavily infected plant, it's going to be easy to notice and that people are going to report that host. I actually expected more to see agriculturally significant plants to be the most top, the top reported genus. However, they are the most reported species. So I'm just going to read you guys some, some data here. Um, so the, com the most common host species were cucumbers, melons, squash, tomatoes, and um, papaya. So all of the most commonly reported species were agriculturally significant species. Uh, the most commonly reported country is the USA. And the most commonly reported state is California. And that's more than double any of the other states, which, you know, California is, is really great climate for powdery mildew. Something that I didn't mention is they love dry weather. Uh, it's what you wouldn't really expect it with a fungi, but it likes wet springs and dry summers for the spread. You know, the rain actually knocks down the uh, canidia forest and the canidia, so it doesn't spread as well. Uh, other common genera here are prunus. I think that was the number two most reported, followed by euphorbia, rosa, and salix. And the most common host families were Asteraceae, Fabaceae, Rosaceae, Poaceae, and Lamiaceae, in that order. Okay, so now I, I, I think I've made it pretty clear that you, you get a lot of powdery mildew diversity when you get a lot of host diversity. So of course, my thought process was the best place to look is gonna be botanical gardens. And you know, botanical gardens have a pretty special place in my heart. Uh, I worked at botanical gardens before I got into academia. Uh, my original master's professor was the director of the Washington State Arboretum. So it, it, it was really, obvious to me that this was the place that we needed to look for powdery mildews. So I set up this citizen science project where I contacted 25 different botanical gardens from throughout North America. 12 of them responded and were excited about the project. Most of the, just a little disclaimer, most of the 12 that responded were people who I had met before. Um, but there were definitely some people that I hadn't met that helped with this project. Uh, each color represents a different powdery mildew species. So you're seeing a ton of diversity. The size of the circle represents the sample size. So of course at the University of Washington and at Harvard, we're gonna have the biggest sample size because that's where I collected. And I just wanna go through some of the numbers from this giant collection effort. We collected over 300 different specimens. Uh, I wanna give Michaela uh, a shout out because this was not an easy task for us. We needed a lot of permits to get all these specimens sent to us. You can't just be sending plant pathogens throughout, the, uh, throughout North America. So we collected over 300 specimens. Of these 300 specimens, there was 130 different powdery mildew species on 219 different host taxa. And of these 130 different powdery mildew species, around 30 were undescribed species. So that's represented by this orange color here. So almost every botanical garden had a undescribed species, which is just really amazing. There's, there's been almost no work done in Mexico. So I was really happy to get these guys on board. Um, they actually, one of them didn't, didn't speak English. So we had to use uh, Google Translate to speak with each other, which I thought was just uh, pretty, pretty cool that we were able to get this communicate and get this project done. Um, I, and, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to motivate these horticulturists to be really interested in powdery mildews. They were all co-authors on, on one paper. Um, these co-authors from Mexico are going to also be on a, a new paper that we're going to have published in a couple of weeks. And they seem really excited to keep collecting. And I'm hoping that this sample size will get much bigger and we'll uh, keep exploring these unexplored places. 
And there was also around 45 first host pathogens reports. So that is hosts that had never been reported as on powdery mildew. So that 10,127 number of hosts that I reported earlier, it's growing and it's growing fast. So that's clearly an underestimate. So now I'm gonna talk about two individual systems that I went into detail and studied, um, studied in detail. One is on helianthus species. So this is sunflowers. I did this work for my PhD. Um, so sunflowers are infected by the genus Golovinomyces latisporus. And this is an interesting uh, system in that that species of powdery mildew infects, has been reported on almost all helianthus species. So it's not host specific um, to the species level, it's host specific to the genus level. So I thought this was a really good system to conduct these greenhouse trials to see, are there any patterns in the host phylogeny of disease susceptibility? So I ordered on um, the GRIN database, they have an amazing seed collection where you can contact them and they'll send you wild collected seeds from throughout North America. Um, and I contacted them, it's run through seed banks from different universities. And they sent me 126 different species of plants in the family Asteraceae. Of these, I think 65 of them were sunflowers. And I grew them in the greenhouse and I inoculated them with powdery mildew. And I, I don't like to brag or anything, but I, I think I'm really good at getting plants infected with powdery mildew. As you can see here, um, I always water from below if you're looking for to grow powdery mildew. Cause you know, as I said, the rain washes the, uh, knocks the Canadia forest down. Uh, this project, I also just wanna give a shout out to uh, Chase Mason and Eric Goolsby. Chase is a, an expert in helianthus phylogeny and studies on helianthus. And he did his uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the Arnold Arboreta. So it's a very small world and they really helped me with this project. So we didn't just look at powdery mildew um, susceptibility and host range. We also looked at uh, different plant traits um, that were thought that they could be related to plant disease resistance. And then we aligned this trait and susceptibility data with host phylogenetic data. So some of the traits that we measured were chlorophyll density, above and below ground biomass, stomatal index, and trichome density. And I mean, we had so many plants. We had three replicates of 126 different species. So in total, we grew 450 plants in the greenhouse. And, and you can imagine also this wasn't an easy task. The greenhouse managers weren't happy with me growing powdery mildew in the greenhouse and constantly inoculating them with spores. You know, I had to explain to them over and over again, you know, that these are really host specific. Um, they're not gonna infect your, um, hops plant growing next, next to my helianthus plant. So anyways, we made leaf peels and we counted the trichomes and the stomata. You can see here's one here. Um, hard for me to see at this angle, but there's quite a few in there. Oh no, the, the, the yellow. Uh, these are supposed to be shaded yellow uh, to show how these different clades are infected by powdery mildew, but it's not really showing up. So, but in this clade A, a which consists of helianthus species, these are the most susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, and this is not too surprising. This has been the main host that these powdery mildews were reported on. This is the number here, the AUDPC. This is a measure of disease progress over time. It's a common measure in plant pathology studies to look at disease infection, infecting plants. But just the only thing I wanna point out here is that PAXA within clade A here um, are the most susceptible to powdery mildew. And they're more than six times more susceptible than some of these other clades. These other clades were, it was very minor infections. Um, and I, I like to call these accidental infections. And that is that these, these clades haven't been reported to be infected by powdery mildew in the wild, but when I'm just pounding them with an inoculum, I can get them infected in the greenhouse. So that's what I, my term is, that's the term I use an accidental infection. So I believe most of these are accidental infections. Okay, so 
the, the previous slide was colored like this with these nice coloring to help you break it down, just to give you an idea of where I was heading. Um, but within, I also want to point out that we also get this fine scale differences in susceptibility. So within the helianthus clade, we have differences based, susceptibility differences based on the clade. And what, what's really interesting is that clade A here, which is the most resistant, is all annual sunflowers. So this is a really interesting system to study because we have some of the plants that are perennials and some that are annuals. And my hypothesis for this reasoning is that, you know, the life cycle is much faster with annual plants. So it's able to quickly evolve these resistant genes. Also, you know, it's gonna be a big cost to fitness if you're an annual plant and you're getting hit really hard with powdery mildew. So it makes, it makes sense to me that they are going to have more resistance genes on a, on a fitness level uh, to increase their fitness. Whereas the perennial plants are releasing seed every year and they can take more of this slight loss due to powdery mildew, slight loss of fitness due to powdery mildew. So then I aligned all these different traits here with a heat map um, based on the phylogeny. And you'll look at here, we have chlorophyll density, stomatal index, trichome density, growth rate, and shoot, uh, shoot to root ratio. And what, what you'll notice is that there's not really any patterns based on susceptibility. However, annual plants do have higher chlorophyll and st higher stomatal counts. But the big takeaway from this paper was that there was no relationship between traits and susceptibility. And this actually has been reported in the past that you don't really see a correlation between you know, cuticle thickness, chlorophyll density, and resistance to disease. Okay, so now I wanna talk about a different system. And this is a paper that I'm currently working on. And to me, this is just so interesting. Um, so I'm looking at powdery mildews on Quercus. Quercus is a genus of over 400 species. As I mentioned before, when you get this high, uh, host diversity, you're also going to get high powdery mildew diversity. Centers for diversity of oaks are in Southern North America and Eastern Asia. And powdery mildew caused by ear zyphe species has been shown to have serious ecological consequences. There's been a lot of research done in uh, Europe about how an invasive species, ear zyphe alphatoides, came in and is causing a lot of damage to their native Quercus rober species. So now let's look at the powdery mildews on Quercus. Before my research, there were six taxa that have been described on Quercus from North America. However, there were no sequence data for any of these taxa. So in this present study, we wanted to look at morphologically and, find, and phylogenetically analyze fresh collections uh, collected from throughout the United States and Mexico and herbarium collections from the Farlow Herbarium. And this is what we found. This is gonna be a, a lot to, to go through. I don't know if you guys can even really see the taxa, but I'm gonna go through it slowly from the top. So we sequenced seven genes of over 60 specimens, including multiple type species. It's really important to sequence type species of powdery mildews because a lot of these different powdery mildews are morphologically identical. So how do we know where the um, morphologically described species, how do we know where it's gonna fall in the phylogeny? Without sequencing these types, it's kind of a, a guessing game. And I'll get into that a little bit. But so far we have eight new species and counting. Uh, this is a seven gene phylogeny and you'll see we have a lot, a lot of support for these different species. And what I want to point out is that this is the part that I think is so cool, that we're having these extreme levels of host specificity, and there's probably been a lot of host misidentifications. So let's go here from the top. We have powdery mildews on Quercus macrocarpa. Uh, this was, these were um, sent to me from a Canadian colleague uh, they told me that they were collecting specimens on Quercus macrocarpa, and they wanted to know uh, where it fell in the powdery mildew phylogeny. And I told them to send them to me. And you know, we didn't have any other um, specimens on this host, so I said it's probably an undescribed species. Uh, and it was. You see, we get a lot of support up here. 
sister to that. Oh no, great, thank you. Um, so here we have a powdery mildew that's specific to Quercus gambii. And what's really interesting here is that, you know, this whole clade here is all very, very closely related Quercus species. So we're, we're pretty much mirroring the Quercus phylogeny as we go down. Oh no. This isn't working anymore. Oh, oh, we're back. Okay. I, I think we got it this time. Um, so then here right below that, we have North uh, powdery mildew species on Western North American oaks. So this is on Quercus gariana, Quercus lobata, and Quercus kelagii. Again, really closely related oak species. I collected the specimens on Quercus gariana, and I'm really confident with my ID. Also looking at these leaves, of these other collections, which are in the far low. I, I'm not convinced that these aren't all Quercus gariana. And this is a host specific powdery mildew on Quercus gariana. And now this is a really interesting case. So we have powdery mildew that occurs on both Quercus alba and Quercus rober in this highly supported clade. Um, within this highly supported clade, there are two separate highly supported clades, one on Quercus. Uh, and they're both on Quercus alba and Quercus rober. And what's interesting here is we're describing two separate species because this doesn't have a specific host range, but they do have separate morphologies. Um, these were all looked at by my colleague, Uva Braun, and he annotated them, this bottom one as one morphological species and this top one as a separate one. But to be honest, I'm not buying that this infects both Quercus alba and Quercus rober. I think that these are all specific on Quercus alba. And I have a couple reasons to believe this. And I think that they were misidentified. And I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone or anything because these are really hard species to differentiate, especially when you have little seedlings. I can't really tell the difference. Um, but the powdery mildews are telling me that these are all Quercus alba. And there's a couple of reasons. One is that the Europe, this whole clade here, these are all North American oaks, every single one of them. So it really surprises me that we're seeing a European oak up here. Additionally, all the other Quercus rover all fall down here. And I sequenced one specimen from the Arboretum that had a label on it. It was from the nursery and it was labeled as Quercus rover. And of course it fell down here. Now these other ones, I identified the powdery mildew here as Quercus alba, this was seedlings in the Arboretum and I'm not really confident on my ID. I think it was Quercus alba and I just re recently emailed a couple of people from the Arboretum to try and figure out whether this was Quir Quercus alba or not because it's really important for this clade. Also these top ones here, these were identified as Quercus rober and I believe they were collected in the forest in Indiana. And I would be pretty surprised if there was Quercus rober growing out in the forest of Indiana. These were identified by one of my favorite mycologists. I look up to her. I think she's great, Kathy Aim. But you know, she identified them as Quercus rober, but the powdery mildews are telling me this is Quercus alba. So for the interim, I, I'm going to disagree with her on that one and go with the powdery mildews. But I might owe her an apology in the future. Uh, then down here, we have powdery mildew, which is specific to Quercus nigra from Florida. I collected these at the Mycological Society meeting uh, in the middle of the forest. Um, and what's interesting here is that these are all on Quercus nigra from Florida, but we do see Quercus nigra other places down here in the phy phylogeny. So my hypothesis here is that either one, an option is that these Quercus nigra were misidentified down here. Two, I misidentified this Quercus nigra up here. Uh, but there were a lot of people at that meeting and a lot of people telling me that this was Quercus nigra. Or three, I think another option is that we are getting some geographic um, speciation and that this, that's why this different separate powdery mildew formed. Also, there are another option is that what happens if we do some phylogenies of these oaks and we look at this Quercus nigra from Florida and compare it to the Quercus nigra from um, Massachusetts? Are those going to be different species? But just a lot of open questions. Uh, here's a powdery mildew specific to Quercus fellows. 
uh, powdery mildew is uh, specific to Quercus laurifolia. This was amazing. These were also seedlings collected by me from that MSA meeting. And we had seedlings of Quercus nigra and Quercus laurifolio just dispersed throughout the forest floor. They were all collected by powdery mildew. These hosts weren't even that difficult. They were pretty, not that easy to, the seedlings were not that easy to determine that they were different species of oaks. But I did my best. And when I got the sequencing results, they fell into two different clades, which I just think is amazing. Um, here we have uh, another species, Erezithia extensa. This was previously described morphologically. It's on a bunch of different hosts, Quercus, Nig Quercus rubra, Quercus nigra, Quercus velutina. My hypothesis here is that these are all Quercus rubra. You know, I looked at the hosts. Um, the, I looked at the leaves in the herbarium. They look all very similar. And, you know, I, I really trust uh, Dave's identification skills. And he collected this one on Quercus rubra. Uh, I can't remember where you collected it from. Um, from, the, from a forest, I think, around here. And he identified it as Quercus rubra. So I'm, I'm really convinced that these are all Quercus rubra and that there's many host misidentifications. Also, you have to consider that the people collecting these powdery mildews, they're not plant taxonomists. They're not Quercus specialists. They're most likely mycologists. So you have to expect that there's going to be a lot of misidentifications. Uh, here we have a clade specific to Quercus marilandica. Um, here we have multiple different hosts. Uh, they're all from North Carolina. I think that these are all going to be specific to Quercus lavis. The verdict's still out, though. Again, we have multiple different hosts here. Uh, this is an interesting story. This is Erezithi calicodophora. Calico and the host, the type host was Quercus aquatica. It was from 1860. And it was from, um, we have it here at the Farlow. And I sequenced it. It fell into this clade. I don't know if that's, that, that host is a synonym for Quercus nigra. And I just don't think, I think it was probably misidentified. Um, you know, to, to really solve these questions on the host misidentifications, we have to sequence all the hosts. And that's just, too much work for me right now, but I think that you know everything that I collected is falling into these host specific clades. So I think just like putting it out there in a paper, all this work, saying that these there's possible misidentifications and seeing where the future um, powdery mildews fall could really help solve this this little riddle. And then here again, we have multiple hosts and most likely a lot of host misidentifications. But then there is one little puzzle that I can't really solve with this phylogeny. And that is where there is a, a morphologically described species called Erezithia abbreviati, abbreviata, but the type host was on Quercus spa. So the question is, where, where is this going to fall? We don't even have a, a species. Uh, here's the, the, the leaves. You know, and I sent the information to Dave and Uva. They both looked at it and they both came to the same conclusion of what the host was. Does anyone want to take a guess? This is really difficult from these leaves. Uh, so this was identified as Quercus bicolor. Uh, you, bicolor it has, I mean, a lot of the oaks have this, but the name is from, my understanding, the name is from that it has this lighter color on the bottom of the leaf. So they both identified it as Quercus bicolor. And the question now is, what do I identify as Erezithia breviata? Where are these species in that phylogeny? And I, this is just like one of the reasons I think that being a powdery mildew taxonomist is so fun. Uh, and, you know, if, especially if you're really interested in plants. So here we have all the different hosts. Does anyone want to take a guess of where they think this is going to fall in the phylogeny? What is Quercus bicolor most closely related to here? I know this is a really tough one, uh, but I, I wanted to give you guys tough questions because you guys are plant taxonomists. Uh, but we decided that we thought it would go here. So it's most closely related to these two species. So this is what we're preliminarily calling um, Erezithi abbreviata. However, I requested the type specimen. It's from 1870 and I'm working on sequencing now. So we should be able to solve this riddle. It is a really old specimen. And my success rate on specimens that old is around 30%, 30 to 
but I'm confident, you know, if I spend a lot of time on it and develop some new primers that I will be able to sequence that specimen. And if you guys are curious where that falls, uh, you can email me in a month. Yeah, but this is where I have it. So then now I just wanna go over some examples of how specific powdery mildews are and how I pick which projects I work on. You know, it's a really easy, or I mean, it's a really easy system to work on and figure out what projects to, to, um, to tackle. So here's an example. We have two different powdery mildew species, Erzyphe vaccinii and Erzyphe elevata, and they form a species complex with only ribosomal DNA. What I'm calling a species complex is that we, when you have only ITS data, you can't resolve these two different species. They can't be separated by just ITS. So here, this is where we have them. And you see there's not support for any of these different clades. There's just support for this one big complex. We're calling the Erzyphe elevata complex. But like, I'm just not buying this. Erzyphe, that this is one species. Erzyphe vaccinii occurs on vaccinium species, and Erzyphe elevata occurs on catalpa and eucalyptus species. It just doesn't make any sense to me, knowing how the powdery mild, how host specific the powdery mildews are. So I take a multi locus approach, and it separates them. These are morphologically identif identical species. But we sequence five genes. You can see on the top here, we have powdery mildew on catalpa and eucalyptus. I really think just looking at these sequences, that when we put in some more genes, that these are gonna form a monophyletic clade, that this is a species specific to eucalyptus. Um, but we are finding support to separate these two clades, but this is also a difficult situation we have down here. We have all these different highly supported clades. So what is going on? Are these different races of powdery mildew? Um, or are, are, these different, are these different hosts that are misidentified and this is separated based on hosts? That's something that another question we're trying to solve. Okay, and then just, I just wanna test you guys here. You guys have failed my test so far. Well, let's see if you guys could get this one. Let's see what, how good you guys are of powdery mildew taxonomists. So Erzyphe crucifarium forms a species complex with only ribosomal DNA sequences, but it infects a range of Brazicaceae hosts. So I'm taking a multi-locus approach to try and solve this complex. And here we have two hope, hosts in Brazicaceae. We have Elysium and Elaria. And I just wanna know, I'm curious, I got this one other specimen on Bertorioa in Kana, I think that's how you say it. And I'm curious where, if you guys can guess where this falls in the phylogeny. Is it gonna fall with the Elysium or is it gonna fall with the Elaria? I have the data. Okay, how did you know that? Very, very good. You're a, a powdery mildew taxonomist in the making. So it falls with the Elysium. So Bertoria incana belongs to tribe Elysiae with Elysium elaria. Um, Elyaria is in tribe Thlaspidae. So this powdery mildew is really separating these based on tribes. What about, uh, so I recently had a colleague from North Carolina State send me specimens on Brazica. Where do you think this is gonna fall? Any guesses? That's a, that's a good guess. I don't know. I haven't sequenced them yet, but I think it's gonna be a separate group up here, closer to Ali area, but a new, another new species. It's in a different tribe than this, but an, an, un, an, un, an unanswered question so far. Okay, and then here's just one other one. Um, I, didn't, I didn't make these easy. I'm very impressed that you got that, that last one. So I have a type specimen of Erzyphe nemopanthi. It's on Nemopanthus mucronata. Uh, there was no sequence data, and I'm trying to figure out what I should be calling Erzyphe nemopanthi. So where will this fall? This is, I only sequenced the ITS. So this ITS was good enough to resolve this. Where is this going to fall in this phylogeny? So we have rhododendron, uh, oraxa, Ilex, rhododendron, hevia, uh, styrax, uh, rosa. I, I said where it's going to fall already. So does anyone want to make a guess here? Winner, winner. 
Yes. So nemopanthus was is a synonym of Ilex mucronata, and it was placed in Ilex. So it, it did fall in the Ilex clade. Now to do this analysis, Powell et al. 2000 conducted a nine gene phylogeny to reveal the relationship between nemopanthus and Ilex. However, you could have just looked at the powdery mildews to tell you this. Yeah, but thank you. That was really good. Uh, and just in conclusion, powdery mildew has a worldwide distribution on over 10,000 plant hosts. It's on six continents. And I hope I really emphasize that in areas of high plant diversity, there will be high powdery mildew diversity. And last, powdery mildews are much more diverse and host specific than detected in traditional morphological studies. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Are there any other uh, questions? All right, thank you guys.